What an adventure it's been for me, I hope for you, and trust for you, that we've been through over this series on the Sermon on the Mount. And like I said earlier, before I read the passage, um, I have not even exhausted the multiple truths and applications set forth by Jesus um, and what citizenship in the kingdom of God really means. And that seems to be the main thrust in his concern, uh, his living concern, is to develop the kingdom of God here on earth and in the practice in the hearts and minds of his believers, of his disciples, and of the crowds, and even over these 2,000 plus years into today. But I have to confess to you that when I first started this, I was very interested in it, but then the daunting task of approaching the, the content by itself. First of all, there's a lot. Second, you can get in trouble. Maybe it's good trouble, I hope, but you can get in trouble because if you'll recall when Jesus was presenting this, uh, it wasn't well received because there were people, like we said early on, you had the Roman politicians who were tyrannical, the the Roman government had taken over Palestine and, and really squeezed out every resource possible, imaginable to the people, the citizens there. And so the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. You had the Pharisees on one side who were taking down notes, who lived their lives following the letter of the law, but they wore their religion a lot like perfume. As long as they had it on, it made them smell real good. But it had nothing to do with what was going on in their attitude and in their hearts and what they believed. Because they thought God was somebody that you pleased and then you could get a special seat in the sweet by and by. And then, you know, the other folks that wanted a military solution. Let's just build up our military and take over. Well, you see, there was a milieu there that is very similar to where we are today. But I hope in what I've put across in in a good Protestant Presbyterian fashion is give you something to think about so that together we can move toward the kingdom of God and the citizenry that Jesus has put forth. And the thing that I found that's been helpful for me is to discover that we have a mighty God. If you'll recall, God's grace is 95%. And our efforts, really, is only 5%. Does that mean we give up or slack off or all that? No. But it just balances, kind of like this room, 95, um, give it up, John, come on. Anyway, um, that 95%, we didn't call ourselves into being. Some maybe believe over in Sedona that maybe we chose our parents. I don't know. I won't get into that debate. But anyway, we didn't didn't do that. We had no uh, part in that. We were born into a family. And if you think about it, even when some of us got the benefit of going to college or worked a trade and got to a point in our lives where some of our investments started paying off, all of that, even your next breath, is a gift. Our next breath is a gift. And we have an autonomic nervous system. We don't have to think about it. Some of us are more aware of it because we have some electronics that are keeping it going, right? Um, But we don't... Say, okay, heart, beat, beat, beat. And here's the other thing about God's gift. I want everybody to breathe for the next five minutes and then stop. And just store that breath until the end of the service. (laughs) See how that works. It won't work. Life is a gift. And where did it come from? Was it some random act where planets collide or stars blew up? I don't know. Scientists have figured that out. It's a gift. And what are we going to do? Who are we going to be? And I agree often with uh, Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber, who's an evangelical Lutheran pastor, a former stand up comedian, and recovering alcoholic, and quite the character. If you ever see her pictures of her, she has tattoos all over, but her message and her witness speaks to people that maybe you and I can't touch who need that saving grace, that word of belonging, 
that the kingdom of God and Jesus was all about. Because if you'll remember, it seems like it wasn't the religious folk or the politicians, the Sadducees or the Pharisees that Jesus spoke to. He spent more time, even in his stories and parables, talking to those that were on the margins, the poor, the outcast, those who felt that deep shame. But this is what Reverend Nadia said about the kingdom of God. Never once did Jesus say the kingdom of God is like a Fortune 500 company with super happy shareholders. <laughs> but I think often we corporatize the church and we measure it in ways, which is okay, but if we take it too far, where is the trust of the 95% of what God has provided and the 5% of what we do. And I'm not minimizing because a lot of times you wouldn't have been able to get into this parking lot today if it wasn't for people like Greg Vandersteeg on the phone with Zebrascapes getting that stuff done. Or other people who show up every week to welcome you, to make sure you get a printed bulletin, an usher, and do all the things that are necessary to keep the church going. So I'm not criticizing that. But thank you for the salt of the earth people that show up. And even those of you who show up just to worship, and that's fine. Because your presence here is meaningful. And it sends a message. It says you care. And guess what? The message of the kingdom of God is we matter to each other. You matter to me, and I hope I matter to you. I think you do. I think it. I feel it. I experience it. That's what kingdom of God practices are all about. We're not a bunch of shareholders, although we share in this life together. And the only dividends we get is when everybody steps up and prays and gets their minds right. And you know how important that is. One of my favorite movies cool hand Luke. Got to get your mind right. But we don't put people in the box here. We want you to have the mind of Christ, whatever that means to you. And we make room for everyone here. Everyone is welcome. It's part of who we are. But I'm, I'm afraid that many of our fellow citizens have thought a lot like functional atheists. We think it's all up to us and our abilities are, and we're assured of our self-sufficiency, not realizing the real source of our power. So there's a little dated illustration, and you'll understand why in a minute. So a little boy, let's call him Johnny, because it's always Johnny. Why is it always Johnny? Why can't it be Bobby once in a while? Come on. It's not fair. Anyway, so little Johnny is put on task to go get a loaf of bread. And his mother gives him, here's where it's dated, his mother gives him a silver dollar. Now, Johnny, this was when bread was cheap and he would have had a lot of change from that. But anyway, I want you to go to the store and pick up a loaf of bread because we're going to need it for lunch today. But Johnny, do not stop at the park on your way or the way back. I want you to go right to the store and come right home. Well, we know how that story ended or began or whatever. So Johnny sees his friends playing, and he just can't, I mean, how do you, I mean, come on. His name is Johnny. Why? I mean, he's going to stray, of course. So he goes over to the play, playground, and he's so caught up in play that he realizes in his pocket, he goes, you know, after sliding the slides 300 times, he realizes that, uh-oh, I don't have the silver dollar. And he prays, oh, God, I'm going to be really in trouble. I need your help. Help me find the silver dollar. And just then, the wind blows a leaf, and there it is, shining off the sun. And Johnny sees it and he goes, never mind, I found it. <laughs> That's how we are. I mean, the self-sufficiency, this whole practice of faith. So, let's start with these hard words. Now, that's why I feel a little inadequate, because faith and discipline, two things that I find very challenging for myself personally. Faith, mustard size, 
is all it takes. Just a mustard, side, mustard seed size with just a little. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's very small. And if you have that much faith, according to Jesus, you can move mountains. Now, I can see mountains around here. That's pretty dramatic. That's a pretty dramatic promise. Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, faith is about being, it's about the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Or as Clarence Jordan translates, the turning of dreams into deeds and betting your life on the unseen realities. That's a lot to take in. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, or the turning of dreams into deeds, betting your life on the unseen realities. I don't know about you, but I often think that I have faith, but before you know it, I'm like little Johnny, and I'll say, never mind. I may not say it out loud, but I start to think that it's all up to me. I just had a lesson in that to just this week. Um, trying to orchestrate a retreat for our staff and for our deacons and um, for our session members. And we sent out a, a blog or a thingy to get people to vote which dates. And my agenda was I wanted it when my friend and colleague, Julie Lancaster, could be here to facilitate it because I've experienced her and she helped me in my previous job and I've seen her work and it's really great. But the other April date is uh, the one that it looks like, um, you know, because I found out just Friday or Saturday that just me and Jolene would be the only ones showing up in May. That's not going to work if I can't have all the staff there. So let's just say I was a little bit miffed because I forgot. And uh, as a friend of mine said, you know, I got fangry, which is a uh, a combination of fear and anger. I was afraid because I forgot the source. It's really not up to me. And what I've learned over, not in my, only my recovery, but in my whole life as I've done inter- inventory of it, things work out. Whenever I take the inventory of all the things that have worked out and how they've worked out in my life, the list is exhaustive. It's incredible. But I forget it just like that because I forgot the source. And when I find out that I can put it in God's hands, I can do my part, my 5%, and then just see how it's going to play. And guess what? Over and over and over again, it's better than I could have planned it, but I forgot that. I don't know if any of the rest of you can relate to that. Because when it talks about faith, when Jesus talks about faith, he talks about keep asking and it shall be given to you. Keep seeking and you shall find. Keep knocking and it shall be open to you. Now, I've heard a lot of shyster, <clears throat> I don't even hate to say preachers, but anyway, use this back in the South when I was coming up, and you could usually hear them on AM radio, and they preach this prosperity gospel, and they say, if you just keep asking for that Cadillac, if you keep asking for that nice condo, God will deliver. That's not what this is about. It's about the seed of faith. It's about that sense of grace, of love, of redemption, of transformation. And if we have a transformed heart, our priorities aren't about those kinds of things, about possessions and about the ideas that we often think. In fact, my brother-in-law was here visiting and he was talking about a church in Texas that really turned him off. They were talking about, hey, and it was a huge church. If you tithe, you're going to get a money-back guarantee. If in one month your life isn't blessed financially, you can, we'll, we'll return your tithe. Uh, that's really not how it works. Because we have a view of God. God is not some celestial Santa Claus. And if we're just good children, God will deliver. In fact, it's often the contrary. We'll say more about that in a minute. Because there is no way that God needs us to wrangle anything in the world from God. Because guess what? We're already there. It's as close as our willingness to ask. It's as close as our desire to look 
and see or knock. It's being willing to bet our life on the unseen realities. That's where change happens. That's what kingdom of God citizenship is about. And the real truth here is to open up between us and God a mighty channel through which God has already prepared that power to flow through us. That's our call to this kind of faith. And this call, really, when you think about it, for you scientists out there, and I think I may be one too, I don't know, it matches the best scientific practices. Seek, knock, ask. That's what they do. You take a, a thesis and, or a hypothesis, you work it, and then you find out maybe that was not right. And a good researcher will be able to report, rather than beef up, because there, there's money involved usually, rather than beef up the facts to support their bias, what will often happen, as it is in the walk of faith, something will emerge that you didn't even think about. And that is the power of God at work. And for those of us, as Dr. Jordan says, if people's lives are weak and devoid of good things of the Spirit, it's not because God cheats them. Jesus often said in his healing experience, be unto you according to your faith. Another truth that Reverend Nadia says that underscores what I believe is the message for today, what you have is enough because it, never, because it is never all there is. Let me say that again. What you have is enough because it is never all all there is. How about that? Just look at the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, the second word, the scary word, discipline. You probably know, if you know me, uh, I didn't grow up in the Ozzie and Harriet household. The word discipline came with a lot of trauma and shaming and suffering. And I had a lot of difficulty relating to this word. But age, experience, and lots of therapy, and personal recovery have helped me befriend and embrace this term. And in Jesus' words, approach life through the gates of discipline, for the way that leads to emptiness is wide and easy, and a lot of folks are taking that approach. But the gate into the full life, the gate into the full life is hard, and the road is bumpy. And only a few take this route. Anybody who's participated in athletics, art, music, mechanics, storekeeping, whatever, whatever discipline, we must all together walk through the narrow gate. We have already done it. But as Christians, it's a, it's a different meaning, but similar. We confine ourselves to the things we wish to excel, but instead we acknowledge that God is our source. That's where the power comes from. We still have to show up. Showing up is a very high percentage that something good is going to happen. We have to be there. And then later, and I didn't read this, but it's right after the passages that I read today, there's warning about pseudo-preachers, and it's very serious. These are wolves in lamb's clothing that appear to be insiders, who know that a frontal assault would only create defensiveness. Theirs is not the way of love and humility and sharing, but prejudice, exploitation, and greed. Their work from the inside is to separate the shepherd from the sheep. That's how they work. And it's happening today. However, those of us who are prayerful, who show up, who ask, who seek, who knock, we're all about not worship service, but worshipful, wor worshipful service. Worshipful service. That's the discipline of spo and with spontaneous expressions of loving hearts. Rather than doing good deeds to gain approval, either amongst each other 
or in the celestial suite by and by. We don't have to do that. We're already there. God is with us. That's the promise of Christmas. The other passage in this Sermon on the Mount, and I mentioned it yes, last week, it's about being wise builders or foolish ones. We can go either way. But hopefully we're wise. And the foolish ones, the Greek word, the root of that word, uh, can be translated moron. So be a wise person or a moron. And the moron is the one that builds their foundation on the shifting sand and the wise one on the rock. So when storms happen, and they will, the person who's built their house of faith on the rock has a better stance, a chance to survive. Another concept for me in my recovery is the definition of serenity. It's facing all those storms in your life, the things that you've created and the things that have been done to you, and realizing that peace amidst the storm. It's not the absence of the storm. It's the peace amidst the storms. And the writers often said about Jesus, the rabbi, the Jew, Folks were amazed at his teaching as one who had authority, not like their scribes. No one could hear these teachings carefully and not be amazed at Jesus' wisdom and depth of thought. It seems that Jesus wants devoted disciples rather than a multitude of amazed admirers. Loyalty, not merely praises. See, that's what gets preachers in trouble if we start talking about this, because now we're meddling. Thank you for the courtesy chuckle. I appreciate it. But it is serious, and yet when we can laugh together, when we cry together, it's a sign of spiritual health, because we know our supply. 95% comes from God. 5% is our efforts. What we have is enough. Who we are is enough because it never is all there is. And the good news, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And he came into the world, not so we get wrapped up in talking about the deity of Jesus, but the humanity of God. He met us where we are and loves us as we are, but isn't satisfied for us to stay that way. That's good news, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge for me and perhaps for you as well. What we have and who we are is enough because it is never all there is. The story is not over. It's not over for Trinity Presbyterian Church. It's not over for you and your family and your loved ones in the United States of America and for the world. The world that God came to save, not to condemn. God through Christ reconciling the world to himself or to God's self. Isn't this the kind of God we can trust? I want to go back to the Greek words that I really love. That throws us off a little bit. It threw me off. Happy are they. Happy are they who are poor. Happy are they who mourn. Happy. Blessed. Markarios. It's the outstanding idea that everything is all right the way it is. But that doesn't mean it has to stay that way. And in God and through Christ, it never does for those who follow him, for those who love him. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, there were three followers of God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Did anybody sing that song in the fiery furnace in vacation Bible school? Anybody care to? No. <laughs> and you remember the tyrant king, Nebuchadnezzar, He asked those three followers of God, believers, to 
acknowledge the golden idol. And they said, we don't believe in your God. And Nebuchadnezzar was quite miffed. He got red in the face. It says it in the Old Testament here, the story. And he turned up the furnace seven times hotter than normal. It was so hot that he made them go in there. The three soldiers that accompanied them burned up. And what happened, according to the writer, the book of Daniel, is that they noticed there was a fourth presence in the fiery furnace. And they walked out unscathed. Their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. That's the kind of God we have. And all they had to do was say, we believe. We don't know if he's going to save us, but we're not going to bow to your golden idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The fourth presence here right now with us. Amen.